the years that him write his son. That's what's in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for your master plan to come the way you did. And we thank you, Lord, for the hope that you brought. We thank you for the joy that your coming has meant to this world. Thank you for the hope that's in our hearts that you're coming again. Just like they were longing for your appearance back then, we're longing for your appearance now to consummate this kingdom, Lord. To come as the lion of the tribe of Judah, set it up here in this world. We know that you're coming with all the armies of heaven. And when you come, oh Lord, you will put down evil once and for all. So thank you, Lord, for all, all the hope that this time of year brings us. Not only for this coming age, but for the age to come. We bless your holy name. this morning. You'll have to forgive me. I was up late. I was watching some saxophone player up in Binghamton. We had a good time. <laughs> we had a great time. And uh, I hadn't seen uh, Kenny G in concert. The last time I saw him was back in, I think it was the 80s, the New York State Fair. Uh, I went and saw Kenny G. He was the warm-up act at that time for Whitney Houston. Wow. And uh, so he, but he gave just a tremendous... Kenny uh, has a way, he just connects so well with his audience, and we had such a great time. And he was, I, I could reach out and touch him if I wanted to. He was he was about three people away, standing on a little pedestal right at the end of our row. I couldn't believe it. And so he looked right at me, and he recognized me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just a fun night, a uh, great, great time. What a talented group of musicians. And, you know, I wanted to say just a couple of things about him. Um, I, 
I, I feel a kindred spirit with him because uh, he and I have played duets together for many years. He doesn't know about it, but, but every Christmas season I pull out his Miracles album and we're playing together and I'm harmonizing with him. And I'm saying, Kenny, doesn't this sound better with harmony? Don't you like it? Uh, but it was a blessing to, uh, to see the concert. And the one thing that he mentioned, and I, I think this is worth repeating, is that uh, none of them are, are uh, professionally trained musicians in the sense that they, they just went to public high school, played an instrument, that's how, and he's playing the same saxophone he played in high school, it's the same horn. He had it uh, antiqued, where they take all the lacquer off and, and make it look old, you know, but it's the same horn he's played since high school, can you imagine that? And uh, that, that's what I got. I, I'm playing the same ones I've always had because I could never afford any other ones. So, uh, but amazing. And, and all of the guys that he plays with, he's been with these guys for over 40 years. And the guy on the keyboard is, was his best buddy in high school. And uh, all of these guys are friends of his from the Seattle area where he grew up. But all of them just entered in and practiced hard. So, hey, you don't have to get all kinds of formal training. If you just practice hard, God can use you, amen? So it's kind of fun, kind of exciting. So a great night, and uh, we thank God for, uh, for that. All right. Um, there is no Bible study. The Bible studies are concluded uh, for now, and so we will pick up again with Bible studies in January, but uh, even though the bulletin says it, there will not be a Bible study. There is still a prayer meeting. We'll meet for prayer Tuesday at 9 a.m., and so we encourage you to come out. And uh, open hearts dinner at uh, 4 o'clock still on Wednesday. No, no dinner on the 28th of December. So just be aware of that. Are there other announcements that we need to make this morning? Anything else? Look at that. We got it. Okay. All right. Then uh, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, Christmas Eve service, 730 here. We've got lots of special things planned. It's going to be a beautiful service. So I hope you'll come and be a part of that night with us. Yes, thank you. There is child care available, and, and the kids downstairs for, so child care for the little ones as well as for the, the, the little children, there's going to be all kinds of, uh, all kinds of activities going on for them. There's going to be different crafts, there's going to be some games and some uh, things for them to do. So you can bring your kids and know that they're going to be well cared for down there. We thank Andy, uh, Ashley, Tristan, that whole group for what they do with the kids every week. They do that. All right, amen. If there are no other announcements, then let's have the lighting of our Advent wreath this morning. Thank you, Walt and Donna Stevens. Depending on how you learn the weekly themes of Advent, love can be the theme of week two, or preparation and faith can be the theme of week two. For some, love is the theme of week four, while for others, the theme of week four is peace. Today, we are in the fourth week of our Advent journey, and we are going to remember both peace and love. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son be the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 4.10. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, Luke 2, 13-14. Jesus' coming was not to mean the end of our separation from God and because of sin. It meant the end of our striving to gain God's favor through our good works. Peace is shalom. Can you say shalom? Shalom. shalom. It, it means wholeness with nothing missing or broken. Because of Jesus, our lives can be whole, not broken. 
Those in the world may be caught up in fear and anxiety, but for us, there is rest, secure in the knowledge that he is our peace. When Jesus is our peace, we can share peace with others, all because our Heavenly Father loves us enough to send his son. Amen. Thank you, Walt and Donna. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 204. Amen. Let's sing it twice through. All right? Twice through. Twice through, Emmanuel. Father, we're so thankful to be here. We're so thankful that we're in this world, but not without you. We know that there are many who don't have you, who should have you. There are many who are going through the struggles of this life, and they don't have anybody to turn to. They don't have a Lord they can call upon. They lean on friends. They throw their opinions around. They try to do the best they can, but they have no clue that there's a God in heaven who's allowing them and helping them to draw every breath they take. He is that close. And so, Father, we, we think of that incredible dichotomy at this season. Those who love you and know you and are rejoicing at everything this season means. 
and those who are trying to drown their sorrows some other way with stuff or with drink or with drugs or some other means to medicate that will never fill that hole in their heart. Lord, our hearts go out to them today. We pray for those who need Jesus. We pray that they will come to know you. We pray that perhaps in this season when your name is on the lips of so many who don't call upon you during the year, we pray that perhaps you might come close in some miracle way, that you might open blinded eyes, that you might restore people who used to be here and are no longer here, but they should be here and they can be here if they will only come back. And so, Lord, we put out our plea this morning that you will speak to hearts in this, this short season, such a short time, when we call upon your name because we are remembering the events of this time when you first came here. Lord, I pray that you will pour out your spirit upon many who need to come and worship and that they too will join with us. And so we pray and help us, help us, Lord, to be faithful in our walk, faithful in our witness, faithful to tell others about the wonderful things you've done for us. And our testimony is personal. We can tell people what you did for us. This is what he did for me. And I pray that our testimony would be very quickly upon our lips and ready to share with someone who may have no idea why we worship the Lord. So, Father, use us in this Christmas season, and I, I pray for those in need, I pray for those who are hurting, I pray for the persecuted church who are suffering so much in this hour when we are so richly blessed with so much in this country. And so, Lord, we do not want to forget about those who are hurting. I pray for those who are struggling in body, and I thank you that you have been at work and you are still healing people, still restoring bodies, still touching lives and, and uh, bringing new life to people who are hurting and broken. Thank you for the light you have shined into this dark world. And I pray that we too would be those bright lights that wherever we go, we would be casting a light upon those around us, the light of the glorious gospel. And so Lord, make us effective, make us faithful. I pray for this country. I pray for an awakening once again. I don't think we have hope. I don't think there's much to be excited about without you. And so, Lord, you're the one we're, we're longing for. You're the one our hearts ache for. And I do pray for America. I pray for the leadership of America. I pray against corruption. I pray that you will turn hearts around. And, uh, Lord, I pray for Christmas miracles this year. I pray we see lots of them in the hearts of those we are praying for. <clears throat> so, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. We commit this time to you. We commit this service to you. We ask you to pour out your spirit upon us. Bless our friend Ed Roberts, who's recovering down in that uh, rehab facility. I ask you to bless him. I pray for all those on our prayer list, so many hurting, so many battling disease and sickness. I pray that you'll continue to keep us faithful, keep us ever witnessing to your light, we pray. And thank you for hearing our prayers. We commit this time to you now. In Jesus' precious name, remembering the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Bob and Gail if they would make their way to the front. And as they're coming, let me give you one more prayer request. My brother Jim Rouse is uh, in the hospital currently, and he is in a very confused state of mind, and I'm asking you to just pray for him. We don't know what's caused this. We don't know if he has some infection that's raging through and getting things mixed up. If it's a medication issue, I don't know what it is. But my brother's usually a very astute, sharp guy. And right now, he is just in such confusion. So if you would please remember 
my brother Jim Rouse, I would be grateful for your prayers. Bob and Gail, thank you. Come and minister to us. The song we're doing this morning is called um, Christmas Hallelujah. I don't know a lot of people know the song. Um, it was written by Leonard Cohen um, back many years ago, but very simple words. Well, when we 
we last left Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus, they had traveled, you remember, down into Egypt to escape from King Herod. There, you remember, well, when they were in Bethlehem, it was an angel that came, awakened them in the middle of the night, told them to run for their lives. They did arrive in Egypt, and of course there was a large Jewish presence uh, there in Egypt. And so Mary and Joseph found a place to stay, to weather the storm, until all was safe again. And the angel had said to Joseph, you're to stay in Egypt until I tell you to return, which meant that the angel was planning to return to Joseph, and he would let him know when the coast was clear, and when it was safe to return home. You know, I never cease to be amazed at the way that God protects his people and cares for them, every detail, especially those who love his beloved son. Amen? Amen. So this next section picks up with the angel keeping his word, letting the Holy Family know that Herod is now dead and that it is time to return home. We'll take a look together at the scripture. I have entitled this message, Going Home. Verse 19 of Matthew 2. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. And we'll stop there. So I want to make uh, some application from today's word. How many know we, we read the word, we study the word, we meditate on the word, because the word of God is a living document. You understand that? Jesus said in uh, John 6, 63, my words are spirit and life. When you open the word, it's breathing. There's blood flowing through it. It's a living thing you're reading. And it means that as you're reading and as you're taking in these words, God is speaking to you. He's making application into your life. There are things you're going to glean from the biblical characters. And James reminds us the biblical characters are no different than you and I. And so just as they struggled, you're going to struggle. Just as they sought the Lord, you need to seek the Lord. And just like the Lord showed up and gave them answers, he is preparing to give you answers. And so the study of the, lift, the word, the living word, is God speaking to us. And application for what to do in my situation is going to come right out of the word of God. Amen? So this morning I want to make some applications. And I, I offer this in a three simple uh, pieces that I want to offer you. Uh, three little parts to this outline, if you, were, if, if you will. Number one is this. There comes a time when you realize that you can't stay any longer in the place where you are. Have you ever been there? You find that you're in a situation that's just untenable. And realizing that what you're doing may have worked once for a while, it may have worked in previous times, but it's not working now. Something has to change. Sometimes it happens in relationships, sometimes it happens in our jobs, sometimes it happens with a place where we're living or a situation we're living with, but the realization comes that this can't continue any longer. For Mary and Joseph, that realization came while they were in Egypt. They had only gone there in the first place because of an emergency situation. They went there to escape from the king trying to kill their boy. But notice now their situation has changed. How many know sometimes situations change? Sometimes ministries thrive, and then sometimes there's a time for ministries to die and let them go because God's moved on to something else. Right? So sometimes we just have to listen to what God is doing. He is a living God. He doesn't just... Uh, you know, the tablets of stone were good in the day, and the truth is eternal, but, but God is a living God who's moving constantly, and we need to stay in step with him, amen? So they had to uh, go to Egypt to escape from Herod, but now Herod is dead, and Egypt clearly was not home. Egypt was a temporary solution, not a permanent residence. 
Some of you are struggling this morning because you're trying to make a permanent residence out of something that was a temporary thing. God's moved on. We want you to move with him. Amen? I don't know who needs to hear that, but somebody needs to this morning. Now, the same thing had been true earlier in Israel's history. Watch the parallels with me. You remember that when Jacob, Jacob was later named Israel, and his family went down into Egypt. You remember that uh, Jacob believed his son Joseph had died. His sons tricked him and uh, sold him in slavery. Off he went to Egypt. They figured they'll never see him again. And all his dreams are gone. All his, his uh, you know, they thought he was so full of himself. You know, I'm going to be somebody special. Well, he was saying what God had said to him. Sometimes you have to be careful saying to people what God said to you, you know? But nevertheless, when Jacob learned that Joseph was alive and that he was basically running all of Egypt, he went down to Egypt to be reunited with his son Joseph. Now let's remember, that was an emergency situation also. There was a drought in the land of Israel. Two years had gone by with no food. I don't know if you can imagine what that would be like, but two years with no food, and literally you're sending to another country to get some food to feed yourselves, and then two years into a seven-year drought, they find out Jacob learns Joseph is alive. Are you kidding me? I thought he was dead. This is great news. So they went down to Egypt. Jacob went to Egypt because of Joseph. And so notice... Joseph is the reason Jacob comes to Egypt. Jesus becomes the reason why Mary and Joseph go to Egypt. But once, watch it with me, once the Old Testament Joseph died, things then changed for Israel, didn't they? Things changed. Mistreatment began under the pharaohs that followed. And ultimately the people of Israel were taken as slaves and they were making these bricks and they were forced to build Pharaoh's kingdom. How many know the devil wants you to build his kingdom? And before you know Jesus, before you're serving the Lord, you are effectively building the devil's kingdom. You're part of his contingency. You're following him blindly. He does it under the guise of you're your own man. You're your own person. You're doing what you want to do. You're doing what makes you feel good. No, you're not. You're building the kingdom of the enemy with your unbelief and with your decision making. And Jesus all the time is saying, no, this kingdom is going to burn. I want you to build a kingdom that's going to endure. I want you to be a part of something good. I want you to be a part of something lasting that will give you peace and joy and love and fulfillment. Right? And so that's the call of Jesus. That's why he came here. That's what Christmas is all about. Right? And so notice that once the Old Testament Joseph died, the people were in misery. They were taken captive by the pharaohs. They were slaves. And they began to cry out to God for deliverance. And we know the story that God then sent Moses to bring them out. And the rest, of course, is history. But notice that in the case of Joseph and Mary, once Herod died, their situation changed as well. The angel brought the news and it was time to go home. So Joseph dies, and they leave Egypt. Herod dies, Mary and Joseph leave Egypt. You see the parallels? Now listen, I think every person faces many different Egypt-type situations in your life. There are going to be times you're going to get restless. There are going to be times you realize what I've done in the past isn't working anymore, and it's time to make a change. Many times, situations in life will force change upon us. Amen? Amen. <coughs> Let's go to verse 21. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. And we'll stop there. Here's number two in this outline. Number one is there comes a time when you have to pack up and leave. You have to do things differently. Number two is this. Following the decision to move from the place where we are comes the search for the place to call home. Amen? If it's time to leave an earthly dwelling for some reason, let's say your house burns down, then you're searching for a new place, right? 
And so whatever it is that has caused this change in your life, you have to find the right place. You have to find a safe place. You have to find a place where God's spirit is, where God is working, where he's calling you to be. How many know that our earthly calling is not a permanent place, is it? Not a permanent place, at least not in its current state. This, the Bible says that there will be one day a new heavens and a new earth, right? And our bodies, these bodies of ours, how many know this is not a permanent thing either, right? These bodies of ours were not meant to go on forever. They're going to go through a death and they're going to go through a remaking. The heavens and earth are going to go through a remaking. God's going to cleanse them. He's going to turn it around. He's going to remake it. But let me ask this question, because this is really the question that all of humanity must grapple with at some point. And I think there's some people that avoid this question their entire life. They dodge this question every single moment of every single day and die without ever thinking, what will I do in eternity? Where will I go? We are told in the scripture that we have a choice between two destinations. And it is all based on the person of Jesus Christ. It is all based on his sacrificial death for us. Those who long for their sins to be forgiven, they will find forgiveness, but they'll find it in the person of Jesus Christ. Those who seek to justify themselves, they will find that God is the one in control, and he's not judging by your standard, he's got his own standard. And that to ignore or reject his offer of forgiveness, to ignore his offer of eternal life, will leave persons without uh, the gift that he's offering them. They will instead receive a consolation prize of misery and suffering for all of eternity. People have got to honestly ask the question, how can I be saved? And if they will not honestly come to the Lord, they're slamming the door shut on their own salvation. It's tragic. But a lot of people today are doing it. To be in a place of misery for all of eternity is hard to fathom. There are just some places you don't want to live, you know? There's just some places where you've got nasty neighbors, right? And there's just some places where you don't want to be. Not on this earth, and not in eternity either. So we seek for a safe place, don't we? The scripture is all about calling us to a safe place. When Mary and Joseph got the word that Herod was dead, they headed back home thinking about Bethlehem. They'd just come from Bethlehem. But they soon found out that even though Herod was out of the picture, his son Archelaus, now he's in charge. And they were afraid. It left Joseph and Mary with an empty feeling in the pit of their stomachs. Not only that, but the little boys of Bethlehem had been killed. They were all killed. These little boys were all slaughtered because of their little boy. And somehow that just didn't set well to go back there. No, it was time to go back to their home. Their home. Back to their families in Nazareth. This would be far enough north in the Galilee, so as not to be noticed by the son of Herod. They went home to someplace safe. There is a home that God has prepared for every human being. Jesus Christ has been working on it for 2,000 years. This home, he built everything down here in six days. He's been working on that one for 2,000 years. Can you imagine what's coming? you have any idea? Paul said it this way, the eye has not seen, the ear has never heard, it's never entered the heart of man that thinks God has prepared for those who love him. Wow. Something is coming, church. Wow, something beautiful. Listen, every human being is being called to go home. And many are passing up the chance for a little temporary pleasure down here. God wants you to see the big picture. He wants you to know there is a home that he's prepared for you. But you can only have it if you set things right with him now. You wait till life is over and you've missed your chance. Your job, church, as the beloved of Jesus Christ, is to get out there and tell people, now is the time to turn to Jesus. You wait till you die, it's too late. 
now is the time. Amen? Amen. And so that leads us then to our last verse of Scripture and our last point in this outline. Now, verse 23. It says, So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophets had said. He will be called a Nazarene. Here's number three in your outline. We talked about sometimes you've got to move out of the place where you are. Second, when you move out of the place where you are, you've got to find a safe place to land. Here's number three. On your way home, you can bring somebody with you. On your way home, you can bring somebody with you. Mary and Joseph went home. They went home to all the things that were familiar. Their family, their friends, their house of worship. All of these things were familiar. All of these things brought them comfort. But Mary and Joseph, my friend, did not come home alone. No, they brought someone home with them. Someone who had changed their lives. Someone who's coming to earth sent shockwaves into the spiritual realm. Jesus had barely been born when the impact in the spirit realm was felt by everyone. It was felt in the celestial realm. It was felt in the terrestrial realm on earth. Angels came down from heaven. They announced his birth to the shepherds. Wise men followed that star right to his manger bed. Herod the king, he reacted with great vengeance to shut down this earthly kingdom before it could ever be established. And the word from the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled that we looked at last week. This is what the Lord says. A cry is heard in Rama, deep anguish and bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Is it any wonder then that Jesus would describe his ministry this way? He said, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. What a tragic word. And it should never be this way. The only reason there is division, the only reason there's fighting in a household is because this beautiful, amazing gift is being offered to everybody, but some people won't take it. I don't know if you've ever tried to give somebody a Christmas present that they wouldn't accept. That hurts. Took the time and the planning to select something special. And you had thought about it a little, and you thought, how oh, this could be a blessing to my loved one. Then you took the time to wrap it all up. You were excited, thinking of them opening this gift. And then you make the journey, you go to their home. And you offer this wonderful gift that you're, you're hoping is going to be just a wonderful joy. And they say, no, get out of here. I don't want your gift. Just leave. Wow. Think about how much that would hurt you. You know, that's exactly what we did to God. I don't want you and I don't want your gift. Get out of here. Jesus, I don't want you in the schools. Get out of our schools. Jesus, I don't want your name anymore on our government edifices. Get out of our government. Jesus, I don't want that picture of the Ten Commandments and Moses standing there with the law. I don't want that in our courtrooms. Get out of our courtrooms. I want you to get out. And I want you to take your stupid gift with you. And this is why Jesus said, this is what it's going to do. It's going to create pain. It's going to create division. It's going to create hurt. Because as much as you treasure and value what I've come to give you, there are people who take the opposite view and they hate it as much as you love it. It's hard to fathom this, church. 
But this is the reality we're living in. And what are we to do with this? What are we to do? We're to do what Jesus did. Stay faithful. And continue to offer it to everybody and the ones who were meant for salvation will get in and the ones who were meant to reject will leave. And the kingdom of God will be established. It's painful. It isn't pretty. It isn't always nice. But we're called to be faithful to him. He was faithful to us, wasn't he? He was faithful to us. And this is about a relationship. They don't understand. They think we love rules. They don't understand that it's a relationship. That he's the most precious thing you ever found. And that's why there is this division. Let me say this morning that I am not a prosperity gospel preacher because I do not believe that God has called everybody to be wealthy. I don't. I just don't. Now let me just say, if God has blessed you with great wealth and you're blessed and you're grateful, wonderful. I celebrate with you. I, I think it's great. But I'm here to tell you that that is not God's call for everybody. And the people who stand up there and say that are doing a disservice to the gospel. They need to shut up. Because they're not telling the truth. There are some people who are called, and, and I marvel at this, I marvel when I see the suffering some people are called to. And it makes my heart hurt. But some people, God has placed a call on them to suffering. It just is that way. So I am not a prosperity gospel preacher. I have seen too many who have been willing to pay a very high price. They were glad to suffer for his name. He asked them to, and they said, yes, I will. We read that in the book of Acts. That after they couldn't tell these disciples to stop preaching in Jesus' name, they, they beat them and sent them out, and they rejoiced that they were worthy to suffer for his name. Amen? Amen. God calls some people to suffer. Listen to this. Fifty-six men signed the Declaration of Independence. They did it to establish a land of freedom to worship the Lord God. But their conviction resulted in untold suffering for themselves and for their families. Think about this. Of the 56 men, five of them were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Twelve of them had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two of his sons captured by the enemy. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the war. A gentleman by the name of Carter Braxton of Virginia was a wealthy planter and trader, and he saw his ships sunk by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay off his debts, and he died in poverty. At the Battle of Yorktown, the British General Cornwallis had taken over Thomas Nelson's home for his headquarters. <coughs> his headquarters there in the home of Thomas Nelson. Nelson quietly gave permission to General George Washington to open fire on his home. And his home was destroyed. And Thomas Nelson died bankrupt. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she lay dying. 
Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields, his mill were destroyed. For over a year he lived in forest and cave, returning home only to find his wife dead and his children vanished. And a few weeks later he died from exhaustion. My friends, some have made great sacrifices to follow the Lord. And some sacrifices come on a very large scale. But how many know it is the job of parents to teach these values to little ones and to learn it then so that they will carry these values their whole life through? Amen? Yeah. That's our job. Yeah. The following is a story about a young boy who learned that loving others sometimes involves kindness and sacrifice. In the days when an ice cream cone cost much less, a 10-year-old boy entered a hotel coffee shop and he sat down at a table. A waitress came over to him and put a glass of water in front of him. She was perturbed. This little guy's like by himself, like, what's this? She says, can I help you? He said, how much is an ice cream sundae? She said, well, that would be, it would, it's 50 cents. Well, he reached in his pocket, he pulled out his coins, and he's pushing around coins, and she's standing there, and she's waiting and waiting. And finally he says, how much is it for a plain dish of ice cream? She said, a plain dish of ice cream is 35 cents. What do you want? Well, he milled around and counted some more. He said, I'll take the plain dish of ice cream. So she went, she brought the dish back, she put it down, put the bill there, and walked away. So the little boy sat and he quietly ate his dish of ice cream. And, and then he got up and he walked over to the cashier and carefully counted out the money. And he left. And the waitress came back over to the table. And she got tears in her eyes. She realized there were two nickels laying there and five pennies neatly stacked up by his dish. You see, if he got the ice cream Sunday, he couldn't leave her the tip. And I think it's the job of parents to teach these values when children are little. If they learn it when they're little, they'll live it all their life through. But sacrifice is a part of this life. Kindness needs to be taught. And it needs to be practiced. And I get it if there's people who weren't taught it and they didn't grow up in a Christian home and maybe they grew up in a real mean, nasty house and abusive or alcoholic parents or whatever. I've heard, I've heard all kinds of horrible, tragic things. They make me sad. They make me weak. But, but let me just ask you, what's your excuse now? Why can't you honor him now? Why can't you learn from the hard things you went through and show kindness now? Why can't you sacrifice now? And when we hear these stories, I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable. I don't, I don't like the thought that in, I think it's around 60 countries now around the, around the world where Christians are being targeted and they are suffering. I don't like it. I don't like what's happening in this country. I don't like a whole bunch of stuff that's going on in this government right now. I don't like what they're allowing and I don't like that every time the radical left has an idea. It's just going to get rubber stamped and put right through it. It makes me angry. And I'm watching our country erode away and the Christian values that made this country wonderful being taken away one after another after another. And it makes me mad. It makes me angry. It makes me sad. 
but I can stand up for Jesus in my little town. Amen. I can stand up for Jesus in my family. I can use the influence I have, big or small, and say, it isn't going to happen. And I can live my life for him. I can sacrifice. I can be kind. I can do the right thing. If nobody around me is doing the right thing, I can do the right thing. The beautiful thing about grace is whether it's on a grand scale or a small scale, how many know grace still touches our hearts? Can I tell you why grace touches our hearts? It's because we're made in His image. And he's the author of grace. He's the one who came down here and went to a cross to show us what this looks like. And he says, now go and do likewise. And I won't water down what the Christmas message is about just to make people happy who only want it to be about babies and presents. <laughs> Listen, the coming of Jesus Christ brought a seismic shift in the spiritual realm. It sent a cannonball into the middle of the spiritual realm. And that earthquake, it only deepened the divide. It deepened the divide between those who are of the kingdom and those who are outside the kingdom. It just tore a big rift, didn't it? But only those who remain faithful to their calling are going to have the blessing of bringing someone home with them. Amen? So my friend, choose. Choose to follow the babe of Bethlehem. There will be weeping. Yes, there will. Jeremiah 31, 15 is still in the book. It's Rachel weeping for the children who are no more. There is sadness. There is suffering. That's a part of this. But I want you to notice that following verse 15 comes verse 16 and verse 17. And I want you to hear those two verses. But now this is what the Lord says. Do not weep any longer. For I will reward you, says the Lord. Your children will come back to you from the distant land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, says the Lord. Your children will come again to their own land. That is the restoration that is coming to earth when Christ returns. Amen. <coughs> so my friend, good things are coming. You who have paid the price, you who have taken up the cross, refrain from weeping. There are hurts, there are sorrows, but the blessings that you have now and those that are coming are so much greater. And so I ask you today, will you give your heart and will you give your life to Jesus Christ. You know you can't stay where you are any longer. You know you need a safe place to land. And you know you care about the people around you and you really ought to bring somebody home with you. So we you come to him? And if you're one of his, is your life really a surrendered life? Are you doing all that you can do for him? Or is it time to start again and say, Lord, I need you to start again in me today. Take me deeper. There's always a call to go deeper. Let's bow together in peaceful prayer. Father, we're thankful for your love for us, the grace you show so much so much grace so much mercy and kindness and you're calling us to be those very people you said to us freely you have received 
now freely give. And so I ask you, Lord, to help us. Everything about this age is calling to us. Everything about this temporary world is distracting us. We can't even find a place. We have to push everything back to make a space to be with you because it's just in our face every moment of every day. But you're calling us to make that place, that space, where we can get alone and hear the only voice that matters. So Lord, come and meet us here on this fourth Sunday of Advent. Come and meet us here and help us to reconnect again with you. I invite you to uh, stand with me and sing our closing hymn together. Beautiful hymn of praise. Angels we have heard on my. Let's stand and give him praise. If you're here this morning and you would like to come to this altar and spend some time with the Lord, you come. And we'll be happy to take some time with you. All right. God bless you.
church, go and never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but share it, share his love, share your testimony, let people know a Savior has come, and a Savior is coming Amen. for the glory of his name.